a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while, and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically, you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are, and that you live where you say you do. Okay? Uh huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. The first document is passport, so passport has been written in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to seven. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while, and I've just been offered a job in the city. So I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically, you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are, and that you live where you say you do. Okay. Uh huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license, and again, one from your country would be okay. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on, that's only if you're under eighteen. Which I'm not. Right, so not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health or unemployed or getting income support. Yes, I could bring that, or a letter from my employer, maybe. Well, that's not actually on the list. So we'll have to assume you can't. Okay, and to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills? I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes, fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Ah,、uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is. So I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use: a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't actually. Now I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. Okay. First question. 
It's still a branch of the Popular Bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually being taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia-Pacific area. Mm. And when is it open, Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's just weekdays, I'm afraid. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9.30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main centre building, is it, next to the travel agency? That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. Oh. And one last thing on this. Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance, you know. It may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial centre is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the centre, go along Market Street past the post office, and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre. Mm. Then you take the first right, you'll see an internet cafe on the other side, and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. Okay, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre, and go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street. Mm. There you turn right again, and carry on up as far as the next junction where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one, uh, the National Bank? You can go either way from the center, really. Up West Street or Bridge Street, and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great. Thanks a lot for your help. Anytime. Bye. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. Section 2. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center. And she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, 
What is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance, and make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that, again, show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. 
When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become. You'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of section two. Section three. You will hear a tutor and some students discussing choosing courses at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty one to twenty four. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. As you know, this week you choose your modules for the first year of study. So this introductory meeting is aimed at helping you make informed choices. I think the best way to do this is on a question and answer basis. So who'd like to start? Pat? Um, yes, there's something I've been wondering about. Will my choice affect my career opportunities? Hmm. Well, for most students, the choice of Level 1 modules won't be crucial in terms of a later career. In fact, many graduate level jobs will accept graduates from a range of degree courses. Employers will often be at least as interested in how well a student has performed academically and how the whole experience of university has developed the student as a person as in the detail of the course options chosen. Selecting modules that will interest you and in which you think you will be particularly successful is therefore also likely to make good sense in career terms. On certain degree courses, though, module choice can be important. This applies mainly to vocational courses, where the degree confers an accredited professional training as well as university education. Usually the modules students are required to take will include all those needed to meet those professional requirements. Your academic department, in this case chemical and process engineering, and the university's career service will be able to advise you, and will be pleased to help you sort out anything you're not certain about. Right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I'd like to ask a few things about the Applied Chemical Engineering module. Fine. What would you like to know? Well, apart from the work on practical engineering, what other topics are covered? Some that might surprise you. One that students always seem to like includes interviewing techniques, presentation skills and producing written reports. Hmm. They sound interesting. How are they taught? Through lectures, practical classes and personal tutorials. Applied chemical engineering lasts all year, of course, so there's plenty of time. And what about assessment? Through project work, usually, or dissertation. Not exams as such. 
Is that the same for the information technology part of the module? Yes. Things like word processing and learning to create spreadsheets are tested in a similar way on this module. That's not the case in some other modules, is it? No, it isn't. Are you thinking of any in particular? Yes, I'm considering doing fluid mechanics. Ah. The work on flow analysis looks interesting, and I like the look of some of the other topics too. So, how is that module tested? That's one of those which still uses written exams.、Uh, the sit-down formal type, I'm afraid. Oh, that doesn't matter. I quite like that kind, as it happens. <laughs>、uh, Pat, you've got a question. Um, yes, I was wondering about science one in chemical engineering. How is that organised?、Um, it's a bit different from other modules, isn't it? Yes, it aims to give the necessary basis of physics and biology for those students who haven't studied the relevant subjects at A level or equivalent. In practice, it means that students who have already studied physics are excused the physics lectures, while those who've done biology are exempt from attending the biology lectures. In the second part of the module, you're assessed on your project work in one of those subjects. And does the teaching approach differ too? Yes, particularly in one respect. You're encouraged to learn by working out the solutions to problems for yourself.、Hmm. I like the sound of that. Okay. Anything else? Yes, I believe it's possible to do a modern language as part of the course. Can you tell me a bit about the Spanish 1A module? Certainly. The main emphasis in 1A is on understanding and speaking, but students also learn to carry out some straightforward reading and writing tasks. Basic aspects of grammar are also introduced and practiced. The module comprises 36 hours of class contact, mainly in tutorial groups of 16 to 20, and students are expected to do approximately 64 hours of private study. It sounds interesting. I did some Spanish at the Cervantes Institute last year.、Uh, passed an exam, in fact. Ah, I'm afraid that means you can't do 1A. Oh. The regulations say this module may not be taken by students with a qualification in Spanish, though you could do 1B. That is the end of section three. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Lake Akraman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire, and tsunami. The giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometers across, and travelling at around 90,000 kilometers an hour, slammed into an area of red volcanic rock. About 430 kilometers northwest of Adelaide. Within seconds, the meteorite vaporized in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometers deep and 40 kilometers in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 meter high tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometers away.
Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Ackerman, the arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection.